chat. We love to see who's with us. We love to see who's in the room. It's always exciting to see that. So again, please use the chat um, to just say who you are, where you're from. We'd love to see who's in the room with us. And we'll give about another 30 seconds for people to trickle in and welcome everyone. All right, get some background Here's music. Chicago, Dana. Yes, welcome, welcome to everyone trickling in. Again, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, where you are, the company you work at. Um, we always love to see who is in the room with us. All right, so we're gonna get started. Welcome to everyone who is in the room right now. Again, as you are trickling in, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat function, name, company, where you're from. It's always fun to see who's joining us today. So welcome from All Rays. I am Marian Arake and I lead digital events here. And as many of you may know, All Rays is a nonprofit dedicated to amplifying female voices, accelerating female success, and creating a tech culture where women are leading, shaping, and funding the future. Our events and the volunteers who make them possible are key to building and amplifying this movement where we hope to rewire the tech venture capital industry while creating a camaraderie amongst women and allies. Um, and of course, again, we wanna thank our sponsors and our partners who make this all possible. Thank you to all of them. And before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items I just wanna go over. As many of you may know, in webinars, there are two key functions. Uh, the chat function, again, please use the chat function to introduce yourselves on the call. And if you have questions throughout today's panel, please put your questions in the Q&A box. It should be in the lower or, or middle right-hand corner of the webinar. Um, we will be keeping an eye on that. And yes, this session will be recorded um, and we will be publishing on the website. So keep an eye out for that after, after today's event. And without further ado, I will introduce our moderator for today. So Abina Anam Soma is an operator who deeply cares about consumer driven companies that transform the way we live, shape, live and shape communities. With stints at startups like Clever and Ada, she has built experience in customer success and business development. At All Ray, she's a contributing writer, sharing stories of underrepresented founders and funders in our e ecosystem. So thank you again, Abina, um, and so excited for our event today. It takes two, and I will leave it to, the, to you. Well, thank you so much, Marion. I'm so excited to finally bring this column to life via our digital panel and you know, Dr. Dyson and Ida, I'm so honored to be chatting with you both today and just getting to know more about you and just, you know, good wholesome black excellence for the for the afternoon. So before we get started, um, Dr. Dyson, let's start off with you. Why don't you just introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you're about and what you're doing. Yeah, awesome. I'm very happy to be here as well. Thanks so much for the invitation. So I am the CEO of Air Protein and at Air Protein, we make uh, meat from elements of the air using the most sustainable way to make protein on the planet uh, and excited to be a part of this conversation. And how are you? Everyone. Oh, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Ida Kudum. I'm a partner at Gingerbread Capital, and we focus on backing high growth female founded and gender diverse teams. Um, and I am a longtime fan of Dr. Lisa Dyson, and I am very, very thrilled to now be an official investor in air protein. <laughs> That's so exciting. I mean, Dr. Dr. Dyson, you definitely forgot to, to say this about yourself. So I will do the honor of gassing you up. So did some research and I found out that you are the fourth black woman and the sixth woman ever to hold a PhD in theoretical physics. Um, and that is just incredible. And can you tell me, uh, what is theoretical physics, Lisa? Yes. Because I like, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't even know. Maybe that's why there's only six women in the world. What is it? Well, what, <laughs> uh, what I studied and what I was, you know, and still have a strong interest in, was interested in, in how you can unify the theory of gravity, uh, Einstein's theory of gravity with the, you know, with quantum mechanics in particular. And I studied one of the solutions that people are working on, which is string theory. Yeah, I, I couldn't even survive a minute in that class. Yeah, you'd have to. 
<laughs> you'd have to dumb it down just a little bit more, but that is just truly fascinating. Um, so obviously we just want to get started on learning more about air protein. Can you just give us, you know, let's say you meet, I'm walking down the street, you have no idea who I am. Can you just tell me a little bit more about air protein and how the idea came to be? Absolutely. Yes, I can. And so let me start with the problem. Why even create air protein from the beginning? Well, as it turns out, you know, we're projected to have over 10 billion people on the planet in 2050. And the question one can ask is, how do you feed all these people? And when you look at how we are making food today, it turns out that our food production processes generate more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. That's all of our planes, our trains, our trucks, and our cars combined. Uh, and it takes a lot of land. So the amount of land that's been cleared for modern agriculture is equivalent to the size of South America and Africa combined. Uh, so one can ask, where are you gonna get all this land from and when you're trying to feed you know, 10 billion people and what's gonna happen when it comes to uh, climate change? And so we really focused on, or we are focusing on a new way of manufacturing, a new way of making food, of growing food uh, that is much more uh, sustainable for the planet. And on top of that is very nutritious. So we're using a process that's very similar to also something that's already used widely in the food industry, a process very similar to fermentation. So think of making yogurt, making cheese. These are processes that use fermentation. And we have this novel way of doing it that leverages concepts that were first thought about by NASA during the space program, where they were thinking about, well, in that case, it's a very confined space. Uh, you have minimal resources and you have to be very efficient with how you use those resources. So they were trying to come up with ways to feed astronauts on long space journeys. Uh, that, that Their ideas were sitting on the shelf. We haven't been to Mars as humans yet. Uh, and so we kind of picked up where they left off and we're developing and commercializing. We've, we've developed and now we're commercializing a way to make protein that's very nutritious, has all the essential amino acids, so a complete protein uh, in a way that um, you know, is super sustainable. And in fact, the most sustainable way to make protein from a greenhouse gas intensity standpoint, from a water utilization standpoint, as well as a land utilization standpoint. Uh, and then we take that protein and we're able to apply culinary techniques like uh, temperatures and pressures uh, to make structures that give you that, that bite that you're looking for when you bite into a piece of meat. So we're making meat from the most sustainable way to make protein on the planet. That I, I truly feel like it's it's magic. Like you're you're. I know you're a scientist, but you're a bit of a magician too. I I would have to add. Um, how what was the development process like coming from the idea of like how does someone just wake up one day and say we're gonna make meat out of air? <laughs> like I know you, you briefly described the as you're thinking about the ways to feed the world. You know, most people think alternative meats or just like eating less meat. Why was that? Why was there a value of having a scientific and culinary process sort of come hand in hand? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the genesis really was trying to uh, address environmental issues. So looking at uh, where are we going? For, for me, it actually goes back to um, my childhood. I, I went to Louisiana a lot. My mother's family is from Louisiana. So I go there on the, in the summers, have a great time. And then I went back to Louisiana in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina and saw a very different picture. And for me, going there and seeing, you know, there was definitely people lost their lives, people lost their homes, people were essentially made refugees, they, they were in search of shelter and some people never were able to come back uh, to their homes. And um, I was there to try to help rebuild the city along with many others that were trying to do whatever we could. Um, but years later, I began to think about climate science and how we have these once in a hundred year storms, we just had another one in the south. Uh, in Texas, once in a hundred year storms happening that are actually affecting people. People's lives are being affected today. You know, the fires that we experienced last year in California. Uh, and so the question that, that I had along with a colleague of mine, Dr. John Reed, is how could we be a part of that solution? And my background is science as well as his. And then I also spent time in the business world uh, at the Boston Consulting Group, helping businesses solve solve pain points. Uh, and so what I, you know, where we wanted to contribute was we believe that technology is a part of the answer. And in fact, the way that we make food involves technology and it always has. There's different innovations that have happened over the years to be to have more efficient production. And so this is just the next step. Uh, and then if we make something that people love, that people will consume, then you know business could scale that. And that's really where air protein came from. Truly, truly exceptional. And I guess I'm, I'm thinking more now like 10,000 foot view. It seems like air protein is one of the companies in the new formed 
ag tech age tech how how you pronounce ag tech is that the is that the place where you would consider category categorizing yourself I, I would love to hear more about what are your thoughts on the state of ag tech now it seems like there's definitely a pressing need for more things as climate change becomes more prevalent to us what are your thoughts on the current state of ag tech are there any companies other than air protein that excite you or are there any other companies that or sort of themes that you're looking forward to seeing in the next couple of years yeah, I think that it is very much an exciting time where uh, companies, investors, entrepreneurs are realizing that things need to change. We need better solutions. If we're really going to get ahead of these, these global problems that we're facing, we need more efficient processes, we need more sustainable processes, and we need to do that in a way that really focuses on health and nutrition. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited to be a part of the group of companies that are working on that. If you look at what it takes to grow a steak today, to make a steak, it actually takes two years to make a steak. And it starts with a calf and you're feeding that calf and you're watering it. And you have a lot of land you've cleared, you clear land to grow the food that you feed it. And most of what goes in doesn't end up in the final product. Most of it goes out. Uh, so it's super inefficient process that takes a lot of time, a lot of land, a lot of water. Uh, and so we need solutions. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we're, we're one of the companies that are focusing on that. If you look at Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, they're definitely trailblazers in this field. And so going from animal-based uh, production of that final end product, that final meat, and I'm going to define meat just as what you end up with on the plate, the textures and the tastes and the flavors that you're looking for versus just about the source. Uh, so they are, they're making kind of a version of that. And going from animals to plants is definitely a step in the right direction. And you drastically reduce the environmental in, uh, footprint. And we're taking it to the next level. So we're going even further. And if you look at uh, making protein with an air protein farm, it would take a soy farm the size of Texas, soy protein farm the size of Texas to give you the same amount of protein as you get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. So significant land reduction. And similarly, if you look at any, other, any of the other environmental metrics, it's uh, much more you know, sustainable. And so we're excited to kind of go to the next step and create a way of making protein and indeed a way of making meat that people love and people are, you know, consuming on a massive scale uh, that uses minimal land, minimal space, minimal resources, and is nutritious and tastes great. That's, that's incredible. Um, I guess last question then, Ida, well, I, I can't wait to hear about, you know, the day you guys met and just, and just clicked, but I think as I was researching and learning more about air protein, it seemed like one of the biggest drawbacks was education. Like people are like, what is this thing? Why, why not eat the meat that's coming from the animal? Have you can like, as air protein considered thinking about that or contributing to the education of getting more people to lean towards a plant-based diet? Or you, do you feel like you're just focusing on getting really great uh, like products up there? Yeah, I think that will be an important part of our story and our journey is, is consumer education. Why is this even important? Why is this a thing? And happily, we're at a moment where more and more people are seeking more environmentally friendly solutions. They're educating themselves. They're, they're out there um, making choices with their dollars, even choosing the more sustainable options. So happily, this is a moment where companies like Air Protein has this, this consumer base, this base of, of advocates that are waiting for our types of solutions. So excited about that. But broadly speaking, you know, this is a new way of, of, of growing food. Uh, and so we do, uh, you know, as a part of our growth and development, we'll be bringing all of the benefits to everyone about why air protein is the most sustainable way to make food. Why is it uh, nutritious? And, and we hope that everyone will see for themselves when they taste it, why it's delicious as well. That's amazing. Um, obviously air protein, you know, had to have some money to, to get it going. So, you know, I would love to sort of hear how, how did you guys meet? I know you said this story with you earlier, but yeah, I would love to, would love to hear that. I love telling this story because I like to say I've been stalking Lisa for, you know, four to five years, but I learned about her the way I, you know, I know we all Google, I know we all like you know, love to, if you're a curious person, for me, one of my personal interests, I'm fascinated by space. 
Uh, and I've always been fascinated by space. I, I think that there's, you know, universes out there and all this kind of stuff. So I'm the person that wakes up to watch the like lunar launches. And and this whole last week with the Mars rover, I follow the rover on Twitter. I'm like, what did he do today? So because I have a personal interest, I had I found her TED Talk. And everybody on this call, if you have not, just Google Lisa Dyson TED Talk. It comes up, it's got like, I don't know, 12 million views or whatever, but this, she did it in 2016. I found it in 2017. And I watched this TED talk and it blew my mind. And so I, I watched it and I was just like, I need to know her. You know, when you feel like you feel like a celebrity or something, you're like, I need to know her. Well, just the, the TED talk, I was like, I need to know her. So I do what normal people do. I put her name in LinkedIn. Her profile came up and I was like, who do we know mutually together? And so I actually found somebody. I'm in this great organization called Women in America, which like all rays, is it's one of these things about supporting women and their professional development. And so we had a mutual friend that had gone to MIT as an undergrad while Lisa was doing her graduate work. I sent her a note being like, I mean, this is crazy, but like, I know that you know this woman and she did this TED talk. Can you introduce us? And thankfully she did. So that is how I met her in 2017. And I just started following her and like checking in and, and getting to know what she was doing um, from, the, from the standpoint of this science. And as I moved through uh, the role that I was before I joined Gingerbread Capital, I just always, like she was top of mind and the raises and when she was looking wasn't quite right, but like I knew it was like something that I was like, I hope one day I have the opportunity. Um, but it is the story of investor and founder relationships. Nobody kind of gets a check on a first meeting. You need to think about this as a long term. And I was like, even if I don't end up investing in her, I know that one day I'll be a customer of this because I'm a huge meat eater. Uh, and I was just wanting, I wanted her to be successful, whether it was because I invested in it or it just, this company needed to exist. So, you know, four years later, got the opportunity and thankfully I'm in a great firm that everybody on our team just is as wowed with Lisa as, as all of you are. Um, and she ended up getting together around, but we were able to come in early and just, you know, uh, I'm really thrilled that we were able to, but like she, somebody said it, the way she can explain this concept so that non-theoretical physicists like uh, can understand is part of, of what makes this special and something this complicated, you need to have a founding team where you can take a science this complicated and say, you know how they make beer, you know how they make yogurt. Think about it kind of like that, um, which is really interesting. And then when you layer in the land mass and all of those things and think about those numbers and how it can be shrunk down, you can take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into food and like Mars rover landing, air protein will be on the rocket ship to Mars when people actually <laughs> go on it. So like, this is amazing. It's happening. The science is happening now for the moment. Yeah, that's, again, I feel like you're probably like fangirling a little bit. I mean, I'm yeah. fangirling with both of you, but anyways, Lisa, <laughs> I would love to hear like when Ida approached you, where you're like, who is this woman? <laughs> what, what, what was going through your head at the time? Well, I, I just have to say I'm honored to have Ida as as a friend, as an investor. And I'm and my friend reached out to me and she's like, you got to meet Ida. You got to meet this great investor. And I was like, yes, I happily would, would want to meet her. And and I've been impressed and honored by all of her energy, her fierce intelligence, her curiosity. And I think that she's just phenomenal. She's just a represent a representation of the type of, of investor that you want. Someone who believes in you, believes in your vision, but also she really, uh, you know, she offers her network. She's because she's such a great person. <laughs> she's really well networked. She knows lots of people. Uh, she's, you know, you know, everything. She knows Princeton, Warden grad, you know, a mm -hmm. fierce banker, everything, entrepreneur herself, uh, two venture firms she's worked at. So she's a great person to have. And she's focused on getting stuff done, helping people get stuff done, putting people together that can help get things done. And so she's been instrumental. She made an introdu introduction to another investor who did invest in us. Um, so we're excited. I'm excited to have Ida uh, as an investor in Air 14. Oh, that's, that's so beautiful to hear. That's clearly a mutual admiration okay. society going on here. I'm just waiting for the day I can taste. I'm super excited because she, like they got to do a, uh, I saw a video of the like sample with the chef. I can't wait to be able to, to, to get to do that. <laughs> it's we did, you we did have a me. COVID. Yeah, it was yeah. it was difficult to get everything going in COVID, but we were able to have a COVID testing, uh, tasting, and so uh, next one you'll be at. <laughs> I'll, I'll be looking outside the window, just <laughs> admiring you guys as you're eating. So, um, but that's, that's so incredible. I mean, 
Ida, I would love to, you mentioned that this was obviously a slow burn. Like, it's not like you woke up one day and the second you met, you know, Dr. Dyson, you gave her a check. We'd love to sort of hear like when you're thinking about investing in companies, what are the things that you're, you're probably investing at the earlier stage, which is where you're betting on the founder and their, um, and what they're about to build. What lessons did you learn from Lisa or just in general when it comes to finding like investing in the best founders in their companies? Well, we actually, our focus is, our sweet spot is series A and later, but like I learned about Lisa when she was much earlier than that, but it starts with, because exactly what you're talking about, we're looking at five, 10 year type horizons. It starts with an idea that you are excited about and then a founder that you're excited about. That's the first and foremost is like, this is somebody that you want, you know, to have your cell phone number and call you and like talk to them all the time. And so it, for me, it was a combination of when in venture, we always talk about a big idea, like think about this, does it get any bigger than the air you're exhaling right now? Like being able to take that to turn it into food that can feed the world. Like it doesn't get any bigger than that. When you we always ask about the total addressable market, like this is a huge addressable market. Um, and so when you think about those two things from the standpoint, idea founder, and then the, the commercial turning this into a commercial product, because it is rooted in science, it's rooted in hardcore science. So taking something that's from the scientific world and turning it into a commercial product that we can then buy at our local Kroger or our local grocery store, that's the part where like the venture aspect comes in. And that's the part that's really interesting to us. So uh, I would say for founders out there, like you want an investor that almost is like, like me, fangirling over your idea and you, because it's gonna take a long time for it to get through. And so you want them to maintain that interest with you and be with you on that journey over time. For sure, that's that's really good advice, Neil. And Lisa, were there any things that you learned sort of, were, sorry, Dr. Dyson, were there any things that you learned with um, interacting with Ida that kind of helped you when you're also deciding the other investors to add on your cap table? Like, were there particular traits that you were looking for or other things that you were excited about when you were, because I think another thing too is people assume that it's always the founder who's begging the investor, but sometimes it can be, both ways. I just want to hear like, yeah, what are the things that you're like, oh, these are the seven or eight or nine things. And yeah, and about. also with Lisa, talk about that journey of fundraising because people see the press release of a $32 million round and they're like, oh my God, it must have happened like super fast. No, it's a it's a process to get to, to this point. So I, I think the founders will also appreciate that journey of like building up the base because you did it a, a different way too. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I would say that um, definitely we look for investors that are mission aligned. That's number one, uh, that really understand what we're trying to accomplish and they're excited by what we're, we're trying to accomplish so that we have that with Ida and excited about that uh, and that can help out in various ways. Uh, and for us, the interesting thing is that we raise money during COVID and what the, the benefit of that happened to be that it allowed me to talk to investors all over the world in the same day, whereas in the old world, let's just say I would have been on a, a plane nonstop and I wouldn't have really been able to reach as many investors as I was able to. My first term sheet came from Dubai, the second one came from London. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and et cetera, beyond that. And so it allowed uh, for the fundraising process to be, you know, in my home office in front of my Zoom camera and really pitching over and over again. Um, so that, that was something that COVID actually uh, created as a, a, a good um, sort of uh, opportunity for me to reach out beyond kind of just the Silicon Valley borders, as it were. Um, the other thing that I would say that happened because of COVID was the meat industry collapsed at some point. Uh, you know, Tyson, not to name any names, but a lot of, a lot of companies like actually shut down for a while uh, because of the massive um, uh, outbreaks that happened in those facilities. And so it got a lot of investors to think about the meat industry and think about alternatives. And after a lot of that happened, we did get investors reaching out to us that had known about us and then really wanted to learn more. Um, but it was a long process. Uh, it was, a, it, you know, and we were able to find a phenomenal group of investors that uh, we're now working with who add value uh, from everything from, you know, uh, the ability to do piloting work with them, regulatory work with them. Uh, you know, they have supply chains that we can leverage, uh, future financings that we could, you know, access plant, you know, financing facilities and those types of things. So we have a lot of great investors around the table and happy to have gone through the process. And one, one important piece were, were those people that, you know, I knew from before being a part of 
the pitcher and actually investing early, investing before the round had fully closed. And so that was because of the you know, relationships that have been established as Ida mentioned and their, you know, Ida's belief and the others, their belief in, in me and our team and what we were uh, accomplishing and uh, enabling us to continue to hit those milestones as we were raising the financing round. That's, yeah, it seems like, again, this wasn't an overnight success. A lot of meetings and trust and building was happening to eventually have this amazing payoff, which then we will get to. And let's be clear. Also, there's proof in the pudding. Like her, the, the, the people that led this round, it's not just like random, like, oh, let's throw some money. It is people with expertise in this space. Um, and as she talks about supply chain, like people that really can see what they started and then say, okay, I see the path to commercialization. And that's the kind of thing that, that really helps accelerate things to the next level. Yeah, it's a good combination of finances and, and expertise, um, which is a great segue to you, Ida. Um, you know, I, I know we're, we'd just love to sort of hear more about gingerbread capital and what you guys are in the business of doing. I'm, I'm passionate and obsessed with your mission, so. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I really enjoy what I do and I'm very, very lucky to be part of a, an organization and a team that, you know, work is like my work is enjoyable because it's just an extension of what I enjoy doing. So Gingerbread Capital was started by Linnea Roberts, who is a longtime uh, investment banker. And we actually were at Goldman at the same time, although we didn't know each other. I was, I was like, she was a partner. She was the co-head of tech banking. I was an analyst and associate. We weren't just hanging out like best friends. We did not know each other at all. Um, but so she had spent almost 28 years on Wall Street. And after she retired, those that know Linnea knows that she has much more energy than I do. We work really well because we're on different coasts. I, she's like on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. And by the time she wakes up and is done, I finally wake up and I'm ready to catch up with her. So it works very well in that, in our bi-coastal relationship. But so she started Gingerbread after she retired and she, she was like, she spent 30 years doing other people's deals and she had never made a private investment till after she retired. And she goes, you know, if a woman like her who has the means and has uh, has the professional network to be doing it, hasn't done it. How are we expecting the dynamic to change? So she went and did something about it and stood up Gingerbread Capital. I joined her, it's heading towards three years already. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and so the mission is to get capital. We have a kind of a twofold mission, get capital directly into the hands of female founders like Lisa, who are building the next great companies. And then we also have a secondary where we get hands in the cap capital in the hands of women who are writing the checks. So we are LPs and funds that have women GPs and underrepresented minorities as GPs. So that's kind of a dual uh, folded mission uh, that we've gone after. And we have been just really excited to see what's coming out from, the, from female founders who have spent a lot of time doing a lot with less because we all know the data of the under-resourced nature of female founders in venture. Um, and exciting to see what the women GPs and, and these underrepresented GPs are out there doing and, and sending us really great um, companies that we can then, because they look earlier than we do. Uh, once they get to that kind of series A round, we can get involved with. And we always say our value add, we might not be the biggest check in a round, but we will bring our Rolodex and our passion for our founders to try to open doors for them. Yeah, that's that's so amazing. And, and it seems that you're tackling the problem at both ends too, because you know- You gotta, you gotta, you gotta yeah. tackle these things. You got, you're doing it all, you guys take at, a break. At yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, I guess based on this, then what are sort of some really fascinating trends that you're seeing founders bringing to your to your to your pitches or that you're excited about yeah well i think if from some trends like one of the things that we've been excited about and we're so excited to see it happening now in with what lisa is doing is that these and a lot of female founders um that are you're building out of a, a personal pain point you've experienced or you have some expertise around that you want to bring to the table. And we have a couple in our portfolio that are around this kind of sustainability and thinking about making the world at large better by innovating. So Lisa's one of those that, and, and what Air Protein's trying to do. Uh, we have another one called Acloma that's in the climate space. So it's really interesting. So when Lisa cuts down on the methane, like they can track the methane that all those cows are generating, they can, they can track it. So seeing these kind of very big ideas that are trying to improve things at large uh, has always fascinated us. But like, yeah, I mean, we look at both consumer and kind of B2B enterprise things. So what we're looking for is really and our sweet spot is Series A. We've looked at we look at some seed, but we prefer kind of Series A and later. 
we're ex-bankers. We let, we feel like we add the most value when you're you're later and needing kind of uh, the introductions we can bring to the table. But um, yeah, so we are looking for the founder and the idea and their ability to explain it to us. Like, obviously, I mean, I'm Nigerian, I was pre-med, so I could have been a doctor, but I'm not. But like the ability to explain very complicated uh, potentially complicated things in a way that I'm like, not only do I get it, I believe it. And I, I know how to, who to now introduce you to, to help you get to the other side. Yeah. That, I think being able to, they say like, teach me like I'm a child or something is, is a very valuable skill. So especially to able to be able to explain such technical concepts is, um, and it's a gift. It's not, and, and you can learn it and you can study it, but it's also, when you see there's a reason why, you know, some people bubble up and others don't, but being able to tell a compelling story and, 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 and the narrative is hugely important in the venture space. Yeah, no, for sure. That's, yeah, that's, if, you, if there are any founders here, I think Ida just gave you advice for free, so <laughs> you better take it. Um, I guess, you know, all three of us happen to be black women, which is very exciting to me. And, you know, I feel like black women are most, is one of the most fastest growing demo. We did a report on this for always um, last year on, you know, black women of color are some of the fastest growing demographics when it comes to being entrepreneurs, but often receive the less funding. So from both your perspectives, we'd just like to hear, how do you feel about this moment right now? There seems to be, I think last year there was 36 women who raised over a million dollars, black women who raised over a million dollars in funding. We're seeing lots of exciting companies, but there still seems to be so much more work to be done. So from the founder perspective, from the investor perspective, yeah, lay it on us. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, go. Yeah, so the, the main thing that I would say is that I, I get to sit on the sidelines as my board member and executive chair, James White, is called on by uh, some of the largest private equity firms, some of the largest VC firms, uh, as well as large companies asking how can they really rethink diversity or actually think about it for the first time. Uh, and so this is a moment where people are sort of realizing that there's uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. And I, I'm seeing, you know, as he's called on, you know, he's former CEO of Jamba Juice, amongst other things. He's been on about 15 boards, you know, public, ran a public company, public company boards, et cetera. And, and I'm seeing as many of these large uh, organizations are really trying to, to, to change and, and, and really address this issue directly. So I think that we're at a unique time and I'm excited to see what comes out of it. And I, you know, I think from my side, like one of my favorite mantras is, you know, be the change you wish to see. Uh, and I think part of, uh, of why having this conversation and, and is that, you know, when people see, get, get, I'm a Nigerian and he was doctor, lawyer, engineer, professor. My parents were teachers, professor. So it's like when I growing up, being a, a VC was not something that was on my radar at all. Like I broke their hearts when I left pre-med, but then I went to Wall Street that my father was a professor of finance, but it never occurred to him that his child would go and actually practice it in real life. And so while they were like, why are you not the doctor we always wanted? When I sent my first bonus check, like a piece of my bonus check back to them, they're like, okay, this Wall Street thing is like, it's pretty wonderful. So it, 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 it took having the exposure and, and I went to Princeton undergrad and there was tons of recruiting from Wall Street that came to campus and I was a psychology major. And the, the fact that like a psychology major can end up in a place like you just need those kinds of exposure. Uh, and so I, I truly think that, you know, us having this conversation, it going out there and saying that like, this is a career path. You can end up being a theoretical physicist that becomes a consultant that goes on and found something that brings all of those worlds together. You can be the former pre-med that, that has always loved science and end up being on the other side of the table that helps science become commercially viable by going through finance versus through you know, becoming a doctor. So I, I think it's having these conversations and knowing what's possible and then meeting people along the way who believe that. So like Linnea has a strong passion for getting capital in the hands of women. And, and this is the mission of what we're doing at Gingerbread. So you know, we were just talking yesterday, our wish when one, a founder asks us, what do you wish for? We want our founders to become wildly successful billionaire type women because we will we know that they will put that money back into the ecosystem 
back another woman, back another person of color. And like for us, back uh, like black women, you know, we want them to, we want more of us out there showing the kinds of talents and skills that we bring to the table. So, you know, the more that people can see what's possible, the better. Yeah. And when you said that stuff about, you know, my parents are, my family's Ghanaian. It just, it hit me right in the spot. Uh, they're know, like, what, is, what, are like, you what are you a doctor? What are you a doctor? And I can be like, I know Dr. Lisa Dyson. I, I'm associated with a Literally, Yeah. It's like my mom still sends me MBA applications. It's no, yeah. Um, no, I, I think what you're what you're saying is so fascinating. I think it's not just about, you know, building this our own tables, but also like, you know, opening up chairs and allowing others to join along for this far, which is why I'm really fascinated about this. Are you, are any, I guess this question also applies to both of you. How optimistic are you about the allyship from, you know, like non people of color? Cause I think it's, it's one thing for black women to do this work continuously, but I don't think effect, I personally believe effective change won't happen until everyone's on board and like on this mission of making tech or entrepreneurship more equitable and more diverse. So yeah, we'd just love to hear your thoughts on that too. Absolutely. I mean, I get to live it every day, right? I am a, you know, a black woman immigrant and the founder of our company is a white woman. Uh, and we are, we are different generations uh, and we had different kind of upbringings, but you know, the, the name of our, of our firm, Gingerbread Capital, Ginger is Linnea's mother. Uh, who was the founder of and ran Minority Business Entrepreneur Magazine. So when you know that you work with somebody whose own mother was out there working in the space and understanding what, you know, underrepresented people could bring to the table, you realize that you can find uh, allyship where you might be different, you might not be from the same or like background, but you can have a common, um, you can have a common mission. And when those two come together, I think that's part of the reason why Gingerbread works because our networks are kind of very broad. They're very broad and, and bring together those different types of ethnic groups, racial groups uh, and across the thing. And, and it works. Diverse teams really do attract diverse kinds of people that are coming to the table. How about you, uh, Dr. Dyson, anything to add there? Well, I'll actually go back to the comment about family. So my, my dad was an entrepreneur. He was uh, uh, started a chain of hair salons, uh, 55 or so. Finally, uh, they grew into. And so I, I kind of have entrepreneurship in my blood. And so I probably was never not going to be an entrepreneur. And it kind of doesn't matter what the world does around me. <laughs> I was going to pave a way and I've been paving a way. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that we're at a moment where there's these you know, other conversations that are happening and we need to create opportunities for, for everyone and for people to see what's possible um, and, and to have examples of what's possible and to have others support their um, endeavors to achieve these things that are possible. So uh, you know, this, I think this is a great moment, but uh, family is important. And for me, it, it, you know, I got to see my dad just have I, all kinds of ideas and got to see the, those ideas come, come to fruition, the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. And for me, it was just, uh, that was the type of thing that I wanted to do. And that's the type of thing that I ultimately threw my life into my, my you know, full effort and energy into. And, and I love just the ups and downs of, of you know, having, being able to think big and dream big and then being able to find those who will support you. And there's always gonna be people to support you. There are gonna be those that don't and you just have to move, move them out of the way and keep going. <laughs> uh, and so that's what I would encourage all people who want to uh, pursue, they have a big vision, a big dream, they wanna pursue it, just find those who will support you and embrace them and bring, have them as part of your network, listen to them, you know, get advice from as many people as you can get advice from uh, and you know, figure out what you need to do and what's best for you and move forward. Really, I think that's just good for life in general, not even just for, for investing or for entrepreneurship. Um, before we move to, to audience Q&A, um, I, I love to do this when, whenever we do the It Takes Two column, we love, I like to ask really fun questions because I think it's fun to also get to know people. So I have a couple of like lightning round questions. If you don't want to answer them, don't answer them at all. But these are just really fun just to get to get to know you two more as incredible women. So um, Dr. Dyson, we'll start with you. Who are the three women who have impacted you, would say would have impacted you the most um, in your life? Um, I would say I had a middle school uh, math teacher. I, I just love math. 
uh, well, even before that, I would say it was my cousin uh, who's a rocket engineer. Uh, so she, they launched satellites. I mean, <laughs> of course, <laughs> they, of course. If you got a physicist, you need an astrophysicist. So of course. Yeah. So, so she's a part of launching uh, satellites in, in, in the atmosphere. And, and oh, so, you know, I told her I love math and, you know, she supported that and she obviously loved math and that's what led her in uh, her direction. And so she was there as a role model for me growing up. And then one of my early uh, teachers in middle school, uh, an algebra teacher uh, in particular, she, she just was a role model. She was someone I looked up to. She, I, I loved the area that she was teaching and she actually was a great teacher as well. Not, not all math teachers make it interesting, <laughs> I have to say. And she was one of the ones that made it interesting. Uh, and uh, later in life, I did a lot of self-study because I found it more interesting to read the books than go to lectures, but she was one of the ones where I really loved going to lectures. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Ida out there. Um, in particular, I think Ida really does show Show you how how uh, powerful it can be to uh, to to bring different parts of your network together um, to help accelerate things and and the generosity that she has around opening up her network, fig, brainstorming with you, figuring out how you can move things forward. You know that's something that I appreciate and I admire. Wow. Just, just well, wow. Like, I don't even know. It was my birthday this week. So I'm just like coming off this glow of just hearing nice things said about you. So um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, oh, you thank you. Thank you. Happy belated awesome. birthday. Thank you. Uh, apparently it's going on for 40 more days. So that goes <laughs> to part of my groups of women. So I, I will clump them into clumps. And so the, it first starts with the women in my family, starting with my mom. Um, I, you know, she's, she passed away uh, in 2007, but like, I now think about what a revolutionary type person she was because my mom came and parents, both of them, they came to the US in the sixties to do uh, their schooling. And, and my mom did her undergrad master's and she probably would have been a PhD, but four children later. Uh, and this was during the Biafran war. So they left their families and were out of contact for like two years while, uh, while a civil war was kind of going on. Uh, in, in Nigeria. So that, that, that bravery of coming to this country where, you know, and they weren't, go, they were like in, in, in Arkansas and Nebraska. And so like they faced racism front and center. Mm -hmm. And it was really the way that they kind of persevered through that and, and built the family unit that we had. So my mom, my sister, uh, my, I have two sisters, one has passed away. So like, I, I just, the women in my life from my family just really were, are and were strong, very strong people. And then I think about teachers that I've had. I, you know, I'm a product of the Virginia public school system, Tab High School, Tab Elementary, Tab Middle, Tab High School. And I had amazing teachers. And I, you know, I'm Facebook friends with my teachers now. But like, you know, my third grade teacher, like I can, I can remember them all. And Agia right there, she is the sister of one of my childhood friends and she also went through the tab and she is a founder now who just raised her seed round. Agia is amazing, I love her. Exactly, yeah. two tab high school alumni right here. So the power of amazing public education system I and really amazing women teachers that I had along the way. So we took advanced calculus, AP calculus, all these other things that set me up for success when I got into Princeton and beyond. And then I really do have an amazing group of women in my life now, um, starting, you know, with my, with, I said, you know, my, my birthday just happened, but my, my best friends created this Zoom to end all Zoom birthday Aww. parties, people from all over the country, all over the world. And it's like one of these things where people that know you better than you know yourself. And so, you know, when I've had these losses of my parents, my sister, having a group, an amazing group of women that just lifted me up and that I can be able to smile and be this bubbly again after all of those things. So that's the category of like strong women that, you know, whether they're related to you or they're like friends that become family, you need that in your life that, that can bring along the way. So that's the categories that I use. Wow, I feel like, I don't know, I'm gonna go call my mom after this. That <laughs> Everyone call your mother. Everyone, yeah. Hugs and like, yes, just tell a woman in your life that you appreciate them and you love them. It means, it means a lot. That's amazing. Well, still on the fun track, what is your favorite like air protein or meatless meat recipe that you're, that you're cooking these days? 
this one was more for you, Lisa, uh, Dr. Tyson, but <laughs> if, you know, if you have one too, please share. <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the things that we introduced and had a tasting around was our air chicken. Uh, and one of the, the recipes that the chef made that was wonderful was uh, sort of these, these tacos that were just delicious. The texture was great. The mixture of flavors all worked well together. And so that is- We should have played the video of it, of people tasting it because uh, randos and you know people that they got to invite, they're like, it tastes like chicken. And it was like, that's what you want it to taste like. So I was very jealous when I saw that uh, and people's reactions of like, it tastes like, if I didn't know it was not chicken, I wouldn't know that it was like, I wasn't eating chicken, but I am eating chicken out of there. Wow, that's so fun. Um, and then last question is, and then we'll move to the audience Q&A. So this is the, if you're in the audience, please shoot your questions in the Q&A box so we can get them answered. Um, what are the two or three activities getting you through the waves, hands, pandemic, panini press, whatever you want to call it? <laughs> um, yeah, we'll start with you, Ida. Oh my God, I probably binged everything on streaming. I am, everybody asked me, how have you seen this many things? I was like, well, between the hours of like nine, because I don't tend to sleep until around midnight, but like between those hours of maybe nine to, to midnight, like I have consumed a lot of streaming. So yes, I, I've watched everything. If, uh, well, I don't like scary things and I don't, I'm not these true crime things, but like the rom-coms, we're investors in a company called Meet Cute. So I love, if you want a 15 minute rom-com in your, in your ears, uh, uh, look at that. But like, yes, I've consumed audioly and visually uh, a lot. What's the, what's the one thing you think everyone should should watch like basically yeah. what's the last thing you watch that you're like oh, oh the, well the last thing i just watched well i'd watched the whole outlander series but they're now doing the men in kilts where the the two stars are going through scotland uh and it's delightful it's the travel show i needed in my life right now so yes men in kilts on stars watch that one. nice great how about you dr dyson i'm sure you know with building magical meat i don't know if there's much free time but oh. i'm sure i'm sure you make time for fun stuff during quarantine well, it's it's really been nice to explore all the different terrain that the Bay Area has to offer. So my husband and I go hiking pretty much every weekend. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, we take, you know, these nice walks during the day, during the uh, week as well. But the weekends, we take long hikes, 16 mile hikes sometimes, not always 16 miles, but that's the maximum we've hit so far. Um, but there's so many beautiful places to go in the Bay Area. And then I love it when we're able to, to get away as well, as well. Right now, we're both in L.A. with my mom as well. We're in Los Angeles, so we're on a house right on the lake. So it's just nice and peaceful, different scenery, different um, sort of change of change of scene. So that's what we like to do. Wow. Okay. So she has a PhD in theoretical physics and goes on 16 mile hikes. Like, <laughs> I mean, can you not not do? Like, like, right? You're like, yeah. oh, I wish I could do that, but I'm not hiking. <laughs> Are you invite me on a hike? I'm like, yeah, I'm probably not coming. No. Yeah. No, but um, thank you. Thank you both so much um, for, for this. We'll just hop into the audience Q and A. So um, just some, some really cool questions here. Um, this question slash comment is from Carlton. Um, he said, Lisa, congrats, you're building something amazing and really exciting. I wonder if you can touch on the taste and texture of your product and any thoughts on heme or other psychographics that come with eating air protein. Yeah. Oh no. Wait, did Lisa just freeze? I think she just froze. Oh my God, right in the middle of the gun. <laughs> we'll just wait a stuff. little. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, ask me one. While yes, she um, this is a question ask. from Nevi, and it's what's the best way to build relationships um, with founders or investors to get them excited about you? Something I'm nervous about is reaching out because I don't have specific questions or know what to talk about other than just introducing myself and my startup. Um, so, you know, one of the things I would recommend is is um, as you can see, like find something where you feel like the investor has an actual passion for, or whether you've seen it in the in the arc of the things that they're investing in, or in the arc of you think something you know that they have a personal um, passion for. And if you've figured out a commercial way of doing the thing that they like, like anyways, me in space and finding somebody that's doing something that brings that world together, that's cool. Um, but then I think kind of follow some of the things that they talk about. So like. 
and I always say I, I, I prefer a warm introduction, right? If you can find somebody, that's the story of how we met. I found somebody that knew her who would make the warm introduction to me because I mean, I'm sure I could have like thrown a tweet or I don't even know if you're like really out there tweeting. So I don't know how I would have found her otherwise, but the warm, the power of the warm introduction is real. So that's what I would say is, you know, find somebody who knows that person that knows you well enough that will put in an email that they'll say, oh yes, I'll take a call because this person um, reached out. Awesome, yeah. sounds great. Well, it looks like, Laura, you just asked a question. It looks like you may have to find that warm intro. Any advice for graduate students looking to break into venture? Um, okay, Dr. Dyson, I, I think your Wi-Fi cut out, but do you want me to repeat the question or yeah. are you good? Yeah, can you repeat it? Yes, I can. Um, so the question was, um, here it is. Uh, you're building something amazing and really exciting. I wonder if you can touch on the taste and texture of your product and any thoughts on heme or other psychographics that come with eating air protein. Yeah, so what we've done to date is we've perfected this way of making a nutritious protein ingredient. Uh, and we've started on the development process for making different meats. And we've gotten to the point where, you know, people like it. They like what we're doing, but we're, we're, not, we're not done yet. We still have a long way to go. And um, there's this specific process that's uh, been around for a long time that uses heat and pressure. Uh, it's been it's used to make other types of, of food products. This culinary technique that we're leveraging, we will be leveraging as we you know focus on those different textures that we could create using our protein ingredient uh, and adding the different flavors. And so one of the benefits of, of focusing on the protein part of it is that we, we will be able to make proteins that have different functional properties. Those functional properties allow you to then make the different types of textures that are needed you know, today for chicken and beef and pork and tomorrow for seafood. So, so we have a wide, wide range of textures that we're gonna be targeting. And so we start with the base material, the base uh, ingredient and being able to, to really address its ability to, to create different formulations is really the core of why you know we can unlock all these different possibilities going forward. But there's still work to do, uh, and you know coming to a, a supermarket near you soon, but but not not yet. <laughs> yes, and also I will plug Air Protein is hiring. So if you want to go work for Dr. Dyson, I again can I barely know regular physics, so I don't know if I could get a job, but. I'm sure some of you here um, can. So another question. And, and just, just a say on that. So, so all kind of roles, you know, some of the roles are starting to show up on our website. Uh, everything from extrusion scientists, uh, you know, engineers that are fermentation engineers uh, and beyond human, uh, the human resource professionals. So we're looking for a head of talent right now. Um, and, you know, so across the board, if you're, if you have, know someone who's phenomenal and interested, then, you know, send them to our careers page and we'd love to talk to them. Nice. Another really great question here is what are your thoughts on regenerative agriculture and um, what are your additionally what are your thoughts on eating meat from pasture raised cattle or farms that are carbon neutral. That's for you Dr. Dyson. Yeah. Yep. I was like, that's not for me. <laughs> I mean, Ida, if you have thoughts, you love meat, so. I know, Ida knows a lot about all these different areas, yeah. so she's probably investing in some other companies that are, that are really uh, revolutionizing some of these areas. Uh, so I, I support anything that's going to help us do what we do better. Um, so that's number one. We, we have a huge challenge, and this challenge is feeding 10 billion people by 2050 in a way that doesn't just, you know, address that, that will address all these issues with our climate 2019 saw record fires in brazil that were primarily caused for to make room for cattle grazing uh so that's that's a an issue and these this is the rainforest that we're removing so that we can uh grow cattle uh you know rainforests are removed to make feed for for animals um so 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 we need to do things better so if we look at regenerative agriculture that's definitely better and that's going to help replenish the soil right now the depletion of nutrients from the soil is a huge issue that we're facing and so we need regenerative agricultural methods for um you know advancing food production uh, we're bringing another solution into the picture and our solution can help 
uh, address the additional sort of uh, need, this, the, the additional demand that's going to come online as more and more people have children and we have more mouths to feed. We do need more solutions. And so that's really an area where we can directly address is how do you now make more protein? How do you now make more food to, to, to meet those, those, you know, the, the mouths to eat, to feed the mouths that are coming online? Um, so yeah, so I support in general processes that are better. Um, and I mainly support disrupting though, um, disrupting the old ways. And what we're, what we're introducing is a way to, to get, to not need animal agriculture because it's hugely inefficient and hugely disruptive. But the people who, you know, bite into that um, juicy, you know, steak or um, chicken breast, they're looking for a certain experience. And so it's on our shoulders to deliver an experience that they'll love and that will cause them to happily replace uh, the alternative. And that's where I come in because I am that person. I am the person that, you know, if it doesn't taste good, I, I mean, I do want the world to be a better place, obviously, obviously, but I also don't want to be like, oh yeah, this tastes like chicken and it doesn't. So, you know, the innovations that get, that is like the win-win, that's what gets me like excited that it it's possible. Like you can do both uh, and that it, it takes disruptors like this to do it. I mean, you know, this is like Jetson stuff. Remember like, you know, that stuff kind of like this is, we're just watching innovations kind of just accelerate, um, but it takes bold people that are willing to take the risk and walk away from the nine to fives and the certainty of, of what you could have done to go push the limits of, of what can be. And I think it's really exciting. So that's where as an investor, I want to see this happening and where you know, if it's getting money and getting door, doors open to get this kind of change out there, I'm all for it. Yeah, that's that's truly exceptional stuff. Ida, this question is for you. Um, what are the best pathways for VCs to support innovative work like what Dr. Dyson and Air Protein have embarked on? Tell everybody you know, right? Like part of the thing of like when we make investments, we tell people about it. And like, you know, I tell my personal network, I tell my professional network when there's opportunities to, you know, talk about the work. And part of the reason when you have a founder that can explain what they do so that you not only get excited about it, but then you, you then want to follow the journey afterwards. But that is um, write checks for them. And then when you do, talk about them and, and get them, ask them, what do you need right now? And so Lisa said the number one thing that she needs right now are employees. Uh, and so everybody on this call, whether you think that you're the right person or not, everybody, know, uh, everybody knows an extrusion scientist. Well, if you're an immigrant, I'm sure I can find a Nigerian extrusion scientist. Oh, yeah. Like reach out to your networks to our whole goal. If we are successful, like by a year or two from now, air protein will be in our grocery stores and we will know that if you got somebody hired there, or you got like a press piece done about them, you helped make that happen. So, you know, like let's all rise, like Alray says, all boats rise together when we help each other. Yes, I will be hitting the aunties WhatsApp group chat with some some job descriptions. You exactly, know? exactly. Yes. It's the classic night, like African families dream. They're looking for scientists and PhDs. Yeah. This is wheelhouse. <laughs> nice. If I can't be a doctor or a scientist, yeah, someone someone else can. Um, and this is just the last, just because we're, we're two more questions here. Um, I, I love this question. What is the best piece of advice that you've ever received to accelerate um, your career? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think... The, the whole thing around mentors and sponsors, like, you know, mentors are the people that will give you the advice and talk to you in the room. And then sponsors are the ones that are talking about you when you're not in the room and putting their reputations on the line for you. You should cultivate both. Uh, and I, you know, I've got to see all of that this week, given the, the whole birthday thing, but like, I have had mentors and sponsors that I, that I still talk to and to this day, and it is why I am where I am today. It's because of those mentorship and sponsorship relationships. So um, they take time to build. So don't think like, oh, will you be my mentor? Will you be my sponsor? No, it doesn't work that way. But like uh, cultivate meaningful long-term relationships because you never know kind of where they'll pan out. And, and I'll say for that one is you're only limited by your imagination. So we can do much more than we ever 
could dream that we we could do. We just have to dream it, you know. And uh, you know, there's so many opportunities for to make things happen, uh, and we can we can we can do those things. Nice. No, that's that's really great advice to hear. Um, and then this is the last question, which is kind of a question that I, I, I secretly love to ask is, how do you overcome imposter syndrome to become the incredible trailblazers you both are in, in both your respective industries? And, and Dr. Dyson, we'll, we'll start off with you. Oh, no, I think I first. Oh, no. Can, can, am I oh, coming dear. in? I think I froze. I think that was me. Can you hear me now? Yep, we I heard can. you. And, and okay. yeah, go ahead, Lisa. You can hear me. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I probably would need more time to think about it, but um, just know that it's 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 a it's a thing that isn't isn't real. So just it's if you feel it, just know that it's just a feeling and um, put it aside and do what you're trying to get done. And and other people feel it as well. Uh, and so don't let that be anything to inhibit you from doing what you want to do. And you can't get things done if you don't try. You can't, um, you know, if you don't ask, if you don't pursue, if you don't seek, then, then you won't be able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So, so just do it. And I think, you know, I, 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 that's so true because Lene always talks about that when we talk about like women investing in other ways, and she's just like, you got to start. You have to start somewhere. And I think one of the things that you notice is that once you start doing it and you realize so there's lots of buzzwords out there, but like when you br break it down, it is not necessarily as complicated as it might seem. Like, you know, I always think about like finance and all that kind of stuff. Like when I was a trader, like in, in the end, it boils down to buy low, sell high. Like you don't want to buy low and sell lower, right? And when you're thinking about things about uh, what you're doing, if you're bringing be personally interested in it. Like don't do something that bores you to death because you're not gonna do it well. But if you're doing something where you find like, I would be doing this if somebody wasn't paying me to be my job, then you kind of know you're in the right place. But also don't be afraid to, if you you are not in the right place, walk away and, and reposition yourself in that right place. Uh, because if you're not happy with what you're doing, you're not gonna do it well. Um, so, but the imposter syndrome, when you know, you know what you're talking about and you know, you're in the right seat, as Lisa says, like silence it and get a cabinet. I have a kitchen cabinet where there are people that say to me, you know, you're amazing because of this and can validate the, and silence the words it, that it, are in your head sometimes because they can see you, the outside you. Yeah, I, I definitely, I like to call it my board of directors, like your personal board of directors. Yeah. There's just like three friends where I'm like imposter syndrome they're like shut up <laughs> exactly. yeah you definitely you definitely need that to stay stay grounded well we're right at the top of the hour so thank you thank you both so much dr dyson and ida for um blessing us with all this wisdom and, and sharing all your thoughts and, and i know marion is back here so i'm sure there's there's other announcements um you both know where to find these incredible women so yes definitely um take advantage of it <laughs> Oh, and yeah, I just wanted to take the time to thank all of you today. Oh my God, the imposter syndrome, like that hits real. And so appreciate those insights and those tidbits. Um, and just appreciative for the time you took and the stories and the vulnerability. Um, we are so grateful. Thank you again for all of you. Really enjoyed this. And for the audience members, we will be sending out a survey. We would love your feedback and we would love to continue more events like this. So thank you again for your time. And I look forward to staying in touch and hearing more about the future of Air Protein. Let's all look out for it. Thank you for having us. Thank you to All Rays for doing this series. Uh, I look forward to keep seeing who else comes along as you keep doing this. It was an honor um, to be here. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you for your support. Bye, yeah, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.